Welcome, everybody, to the Kona Shame Veterinary Podcast. I am your host, Dr. Andy Rourke. Guys, I got a great one today with my friend, internal medicine specialist, Dr. Andrew Woolcock. We are talking about IMHA in the Cocker Spaniel, which is a breed that is super common to have IMHA. Guys, I love uh, talking to Andrew. He is, he's awesome. This is a great episode. You're going to get a ton of pearls in a short amount of time. Let's get into this episode. This is your show. We're glad you're here. We want to help you in your veterinary career. Welcome to the Cone of Shame with Dr. Andy Rourke. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Andrew Woolcock. Thanks for being here. Yes, thank you very much. My pleasure. I mean, it's my pleasure. I'm so glad to have you on here. Um, I, I I do love to have uh, conversations with the internists. You guys, mm-hmm. uh, you know, it, the number one person I refer to is the internist. And so it's great to have somebody on and talk through these sorts of cases. You, my friend, are an internist at Purdue University's College of Veterinary Medicine. Uh, you are a Midwest guy. You did your residency down at the University of Georgia, Go Dogs, uh, which is which is near uh, near my neck of the woods. Yes. And I wanted to bring you in uh, today and uh, share a case with you. Is that okay? That sounds great. Great. This is a game I call, uh, how do you treat that? I'm going to lay out a case and and walk me through it and make sure I don't make a fool of myself. Okay. Okay. I'll do my best. (laughs) You're like, this is a steep, possibly steep order. (laughs) I get it. Uh, Okay. I have in exam room three, a six-year-old female spade cocker spaniel named Liza. Liza was fine until yesterday, according to the owners. And then this morning, Liza is, I mean, here's nonspecific for you, lethargic, doesn't really want to eat, kind of has to be hand fed. She seems depressed. And then what happened recently that really set him off was she, she collapsed. Mom thinks that this may have been a seizure. Dad thinks it might be heart disease, uh, but they are really fixated on her collapse. On a, a quick physical examination. She's got sort of elevated heart rate. Um, Her mucous membranes are pale, maybe slightly yellow uh, Mm -hmm. a little bit when I'm checking, uh, when I'm looking in her mouth, especially. Um, Her, uh, her, just because she was pale, I I did just a quick PCV total solids. Uh, The PCV is low. Uh, it, it's it's under 18, uh, so I'm I'm definitely worried about uh, about some sort of bleeding disorder. Um, total solids seem normal, but but the serum itself is red, and the techs were like, "Hey, you better look at this." So when they spin it down, I'm still just getting kind of red, red, yellow sort of sort of serum in my PCV. Which, hey, maybe that's nothing. Maybe it's something. Um, I want to I want to bring Liza to you and just say, Andrew, how do you treat that? Where 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 is your head when I lay this case out? Uh, where do I need to go from here? Yeah, thank, thanks very much. First of all, um, yeah, let's do our best for Liza. I'm guessing Liza with a Z here. Yeah, um, totally. And, uh, and so I think one of the, the best things that happened already is that on intake, when it is discovered that Liza had this collapse episode, it was triaged to the point where she's already in the back and you're doing some triage diagnostics, which I think is great because the, you know, the owners, owners, when they see a collapse episode, of course, that's very dramatic, very scary. And so for them to already be bringing you differentials like seizure or heart disease is wonderful. And so then you're in the back going, okay, is it one of those two things or should I be concerned for something else? And the pale mucous membranes, to me, always makes me think, okay, we're dealing with some sort of poor perfusion issue. We're not getting oxygen to the tissues that we're hoping. And that's either because of a blood pressure issue, um, a a state of shock, maybe heart disease, or as we now know with the PCV total solids, some kind of very severe anemia. And likely in a dog who's very ill, it's some combination of those things, you know, poor perfusion and anemia, or, you know, anemia with hypotension or something like that. So, Already with this case, the anemia is a big concern and is is a high yield problem that if you pursue, you know, we're likely to um, to get to the bottom of. Okay, go ahead and start to lay down. Um, what does your sort of initial diagnostic workup of this dog look like? So I told you PCV total solids. Um, you know, you just you just lay down a couple of things. Uh, you mentioned blood pressure. Um, where do you go? So mom and dad are they are obviously very concerned. Um, I just did a very quick test. What is your initial battery of tests on this dog and why? Yeah, great. So 
because of the collapse episode, I think in addition to doing the PCV total solids that you've already done, the blood pressure to evaluate for hypotension, if you've got a uh, an ECG nearby just to make sure that we don't have an obvious cardiac arrhythmia or something like that, then mm -hmm. that's, that's a, a quick thing to do given that the collapse episode is being reported. But already with the anemia, you can at least suspect that there's a chance that there is an, a, a cardiac arrhythmia without that being the primary cause, but at least mm -hmm. good to evaluate for. But now that you know that you've got such a severe anemia, you can probably link that to the lethargy, poor appetite, and likely the collapse episode that they're seeing. So right. completing the remaining parts of your physical exam may reveal some of the other things we expect to see with anemia, like um, probably a heart murmur, likely to be quite tachycardic and tachypnic as compensation for that anemia. And then you're going to evaluate on your physical exam for any other things that can help you move toward the, you know, one of the three main uh, causes for anemia, whether that be blood loss somewhere, a hemolytic process, or um, you know, b bone marrow disease or decreased production, although that can be difficult for you to detect anything on your exam. So in reality, you're looking for markers of loss or hemolysis. So do you see bruising? Do you see um, obvious hemorrhage somewhere like in the mouth, um, coming from the nose on your rectal exam, things like that? Um, uh, are you detecting pain, distended abdomen, um, uh, decrease or, or dull sounds when you're trying to escalate the chest? Anything that would... Um, indicate to you that you're looking for evidence of blood loss, um, yeah. especially to explain kind of the acute decline of this patient. Um, so that, that, that would be the, the very initial thing before you're really reaching for true diagnostic tests that just aren't, you know, in your, in your own hands. Yeah, that, that totally makes sense. So, so um, yeah, we've, we've got, um, we've got a, anemia, start looking for blood loss. Um, yeah, with, with palpation, auscultation, all those things. Okay, that, that totally makes sense. If I go through this process, um, I'm not finding fluid in the abdomen, I stuck an ultrasound probe on there, you know, just looked around looking for free fluid in the abdomen. I don't, I don't see anything. Uh, the lungs generally ascult, ascult normally other than, uh, you know, other than, than a rapid heart rate uh, that I can hear. Uh, so, so I, at this point, I, I'm, I'm getting I'm getting interested in, in hemolytic disease. Let, let's talk, let's talk uh, root cause analysis. So if I have a hemolytic disease in this dog, right, there's, there's idiopathic hemolytic disease. There's, there's also cancer related he, hemolysis. Where do you, where do you kind of go from there? Does it matter to you in the moment what you're looking for? Are you trying to differentiate underlying pathology right now? Or are you just trying to stabilize the patient? How, how do you balance those things? I think that right now, stabilizing the patient is going to be key. Um, but some of the root causes or the causes for hemolysis are going to be really important in determining kind of the steps immediately following stabilization because right. they're really going to guide the long-term therapy. So I think at this point, we turn our attention to the color changes that you've already described. The mucous membranes maybe had a slight yellow tinge to them. The serum on the PCV total solids tube, which is a really helpful piece of information, was red to maybe orange in color. So it had a, a change that didn't clear when you centrifuge it again. And to me, those are some real clear clues that there's a hemolytic process going on. And so from there, you can kind of pursue further diagnostics. I, I want you to unpack that for me a little bit. So PCV total solids, you're a big fan uh, of this as an initial step. And, and I've heard you explain this before. But just real quick, run me through all the, all the information that we get out of this simple PCV total solid test. Break that, break that down for me. Yeah, it's an incredible test. It's a small microhematocrit tube that gives you a huge amount of information because not only in Liza were we able to identify that her PCV is, you know, less than 18%, so quite a severe anemia, but you can also identify things like the total solids, which we already have learned is normal, and that can help us to deprioritize things like blood loss, where you'd expect to be losing all that protein as well. And then the serum color is something that we don't often think about, but can be incredibly helpful because, you know, we've spun a bunch of, you've, you know, we've all spun a bunch of PCBs, hundreds of them, and so often the serum color is clear, and so we think nothing of it. But those right. times where the color is is abnormal, it can really start to guide us towards an underlying disease process. The kind of red discoloration can be really helpful for hemolysis. The yellow discoloration also helpful for hemolysis or for liver disease or something like that. So um, the serum color can be really helpful. And then even, you know, some smaller things like looking at the Buffy coat. If it's a huge Buffy coat, then you know this patient is highly inflammatory, lots of white blood cells in circulation. So it's, it's a lot of information from a, a small tube. Okay. 
So, so we've brought this patient in. We we sort of done our diagnostic batteries. We we have a, a general idea acutely of what's going on. The owners are going to kind of ask me uh, prognosis. How do you have that conversation, especially if you're not exactly sure what has caused uh, this? What what sort of guidance do you give to them? Because they're going, Doc, how severe is it? And, and you know, and, and they're looking for some sort of guidance from me. I'm still I still feel largely in the dark at this point as far as what the long term prognosis is going to be. How how do you? I don't expect you to have a crystal ball and and, and have the answers, but how do you handle those conversations? Yeah, it is a challenging conversation because at this point, you have enough information to say to them that you are suspicious of a hemolytic process. But from there, your responsibility as a veterinarian is to try and determine, is there a secondary or underlying cause for this hemolysis? And if there is, some of those are very fixable, very treatable, even curable, whereas other ones pose other challenges. But if ultimately you settle on an idiopathic cause, which is the most common in in terms of canine hemolytic anemias, then prognosis is really and unfortunately dependent on the ability of the client to move forward with treatment. A dog like this who's already decompensating for an anemia is very likely to need blood product, and that's only in the initial phase. Then you're starting immune suppressive therapy, which can sometimes be months of therapy um, and a lot of doctor visits. But if the client is able to support their their pet through that and and um, comply with what can be a really challenging treatment course, then um, the prognosis can be fair to good in these patients. I think over the last 25 years, when you look at the literature, survival rates used to be abysmal. And now more and more new literature because of the, you know, greater availability of blood product and the greater knowledge and, and access to um, different medications, I think has helped us to, to really improve our um, success with this disease, but it's still a, a long road. Okay. No, that, that, that absolutely makes sense. I, I think that that can have that conversation in a, in a reasonable way. Hey guys, I just want to jump in with a couple of quick announcements. I have got to thank Banfield, the pet hospital for making transcripts of this podcast possible guys in an effort to increase inclusivity and uh, accessibility in our profession to get people the information and, and to make sure everyone is included. Banfield has stepped up and made this a uh, tr- made transcripts possible. You can find them at drandywork.com. Thank you to them. This is something I wouldn't be able to do without their help. God, it makes me so good to be able to offer this. Hey gang, let me ask you a question. If you could make clients easier to handle for your veterinary team, would you do it? Would you make clients, uh, the client experience better for yourself and the people that you work with? Well, if your answer is yes, I just want you to know that I have worked really hard to help make this happen. I have two online on-demand courses in the Dr. Andy Rourke store. One of them is all about charming angry clients and the other one is all about building trust and relationships with pet owners. Uh, Guys, I I worked really hard on these. This is the culmination of over a decade of lecture that I have done around the world and working on these topics. Uh, it It is my best stuff broken up into five to 10 minute modules that you can just drop into staff meetings. You can put them wherever you want. It does not have to be a big deal. You can use them in morning huddles, but it is a way that you can keep giving your people tools just to make their lives easier because that's what they're all about. If you're interested, head over to drandywork.com and just click on the store button and you can see what's there. Uh, I've also got uh, what's on my Scrubs card game, which is just something fun, little team building educational activity that, uh, that might make your people laugh. Anyway, I want you guys to know that that's there. I hope that you will check it out. In the Uncharted Veterinary Community, guys, we're doing a workshop that I'm super proud of. It is my friend, the one and only Dr. Amanda Doran, and she is doing a workshop called Navigating Neurodiversity, Your Clients, Coworkers, and Self. This is all about navigating interactions with different people and creating a culture that is supportive of neurodiversity in the workplace. Guys, this is not a work a shop that I have seen before. I am super excited to have it. I think these are conversations we need to be having. I'm really proud to be a part of the Uncharted Veterinary Community uh, and being able to help bring out workshops like this. As always, this workshop is free to our Uncharted members. It is $99 to the public. I will put a link down in the show notes. And now let's get back into this episode. Let's let's talk about beyond uh, beyond a blood transfusion, right? Especially if we're having this this what seems to be a rapid drop in the PCV since no concerns last night, and then today we're ha- we're having these things. Do you just just um, 
I know it's more art than science probably. When you hear of those types of drops, uh, do you anticipate a continued drop? If you see this, are you um, are you kind of a, a wait and see person? If, 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 if this pet presents to me, you have PCV of 18 and they say she was fine last night. In my mind, I'm picturing the trajectory, the downward slope of what's been going on. And I'm concerned it's gonna continue on. I'm gonna go ahead and push hard for blood product at this point. Do you agree with that? Do you, do you, do I have a little bit more leeway than I think? I, in your experience, from the time that they come in, what is the risk that they that they continue to decline rapidly versus uh, by the time they come in, they've generally sort of stabilized? Yeah, with the acute presentation that Liza had, I think that your instinct to uh, be more aggressive in the way that you're recommending stabilization and blood product is appropriate. Because I, I think that these are patients who will continue to hemolyze their, their red blood cells and continue to decline in their um, clinical state. And because of the fact that we know the bone marrow is going to take three to five days before it's really able to respond to this drop, you, we're not going to have that time to let mm. them start to, to, to resolve this on their own. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Let's go ahead and start talking about immunotherapy, if you don't mind. Can you go ahead and walk me through what the thought process there and sort of the, um, the, uh, the most up-to-date sort of treatment approach for, for trying to get this back under control? Yeah, I think um, if we can, you know, fulfill the diagnostic criteria for IMHA, which I'm happy to talk about, then treatment wise is, you know, gold standard is immune suppression. And still, you know, we reach for old reliable of corticosteroids or prednisone because that is um, a medication that at immune suppressive doses has some of the broadest immune suppressive effects of any drug out there in terms of suppressing you know, every type of leukocyte and complement and antibody responses. It, it suppresses it all, and it has the added benefit of doing it very rapidly. So you're mm -hmm. able to start seeing immune suppressive effects within 48 to 72 hours of starting that drug, and we don't have anything else out there that can do it that quickly. So in this disease, it is absolutely the mainstay. Um, there is, of course, lots of information about, out there about other drugs that can be added to steroids to help with this disease. And as of now, we don't have a lot of consensus about which, about if there is one that is superior to the others, but we at least have some criteria that we try to use to guide when we would add a second drug. And so for me, that is often a patient who isn't responding to steroids in the first few days, okay. a patient who needs more than one blood transfusion within a 24-hour period. That's something that we've you know, chosen as kind of a marker of severity of the disease process. A patient who's suffering ex you know, really quite severe side effects of their steroids, and we want to use this second medication as a means to um, taper that steroid more quickly to try to relieve those steroid-related side effects. And then probably the fourth criteria that I often use when I'm thinking about choosing a second agent is if I'm dealing with a very large breed dog. Now, Liza, being a Cocker Spaniel, is not a large dog, so she may not be a dog that I'm immediately thinking about needing more than just steroids. But um, large breed dogs, as we all know, are so susceptible to high-dose steroid side effects, especially things like muscle loss, atrophy, ligament laxity, weakness, etc. And so we just can't get away with high-dose steroids in large breed dogs like we can in some of our smaller breed dogs. And so if it is a, a Labrador, something bigger than that, then I'm often using more than just steroids to try and get them off of the steroid sooner. Talk, talk to me a little bit. I've got a couple questions here, but but I want to stay on this on this large breed dog thing for a second because I, yeah. I I totally understand what you're saying and that 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 resonates and makes sense with everything that I've seen. Uh, what are your what is your go to right now in in the Labrador in the Rhodesian Ridgeback? You know, in in the big dog that's ninety pounds uh, that presents for this. If you're if you're wary of steroids, what what are you reaching for right now, Andrew? Yeah, so I I still reach for steroids, but I think when you look at the um, formularies that cite an immune suppressive dose of steroids as being between two and four milligrams per kilogram per day. And yeah. then you have your Labrador patient who's, I don't know, 
40 kilograms. Yeah. And so now you're looking at starting at something like 80 or 100 milligrams of PrEP per day. That's, yeah. that's a lot of steroid and can really do a lot more harm than good. So I still do start steroids, but I try and dose them more based on body surface area. And so oftentimes they may end up with about 50 to 60 milligrams of PrEP. And that's often the cap that I use yeah. almost regardless of the size of dog. Um, but then I think it's natural to be fearful that you're not accomplishing what you're hoping to in terms of sure. suppression. So on top of that, I add an adjunctive agent. And I would say the two that I use most commonly are cyclosporine or mycophenolate are the probably two immune suppressive medications that I use in addition to steroids. No, that, Okay, that's super helpful. Uh, that that definitely makes sense. I think it, it fits anecdotally with what I see. Every it, anytime I have a dog over about forty milligrams of of steroid or of bread, they 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 pant, they drink, they pee, they drive the owners nuts. Um, you know, they just it 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 seems to be a miserable experience for mm-hmm. for them. So that that makes complete sense. I, I've a hundred percent done those calculations. Just been like, this doesn't seem right. This just it seems like this is going to be miserable for everybody. Yeah, and I think if it was just going to be for a short course of of steroids, something for a severe inflammatory response, allergic reaction, of course, we know uh, these large breed dogs can tolerate that. But when you're talking about immune-mediated hemolytic anemia for which they're going to be on steroids, maybe four to six months, something like that, then you really start to worry about the, the, the kind of long-term side effects of high-dose steroids. Well, let's talk about that because that's that's another sort of emotional part of this for me because I, I I do not want to be too soft and not get the job done, you know, and so I feel this pressure to go heavy, and at the same time I go, man, this is not a week. This is this is a long a, a long term experience. Walk me through your rationale on monitoring this condition. So let's say that we get some some uh, seventy two hour response and we feel like. The patient's doing better. We're seeing an up, uptick in the in the pack cell volume. Uh, you know, I, I'm starting to feel good about this. The owners are ready to go home. They've spent a, a good amount of money. They would like to try to nurse at home. Uh, talk to me. Talk to me about where we go from here. And again, they're going to want to know how long are we in this for. And I want to set realistic expectations because I do not want them to get in their head. They're done with this in three weeks or six weeks. And then I'm I'm fighting with them and saying, look, if you move too fast, this is going to be a problem. And so it's much easier if I can just set some good expectations at the beginning. Help me do that. Yeah. So um, one of the things that I think is a relief to clients is that it is not our goal that we um, normalize their PCV before they can go home, right? We right. just want to see that they're stable. And so usually my first celebration is when they plateau. You know, if they, if, if, they, if I gave them their blood product, they're getting their medic, they're getting on their treatment and um, they've been sitting at, you know, 22% for 24 hours. That's huge. That's amazing that they're holding steady. Um, so once they're home, then a few of the milestones we're looking for to help us feel comfortable adjusting their medications are um, evidence of a regenerative response. So you want to see that their bone marrow does start to catch up and start to replace their deficit. And then you want to see some of those markers of hemolysis start to um, go away. So things like the um, serum discoloration that we already talked about, the icterus, the red discoloration, let's hope that that has gone away. Some of the um, kind of like cell changes that you can see on a blood smear, like agglutination or spherocytes, you want to see that those have normalized. And then once a patient has been stable for or, you know, at home about two to three weeks, and they are either in a clinical remission or approaching that, meaning their or their PCV is is getting close to the normal range. That's a very reasonable time to start a conservative taper of their steroids. And then often what I talk with clients about is, you know, I say, let's get your calendar out and let's start choosing a very regular time that we see you every, you know, somewhere between two and four weeks, depending Mm -hmm. on your preference as a, as a clinician, depending on how severe their disease process was, depending on how risk averse your client may be. If they are extremely risk averse, then maybe you don't taper quite as quickly, um, and then just have them coming in regularly to have something at least like a PCV total solids checked in a, in a physical exam, if not occasionally evaluating a full CVC. And use each of those time points to help, you know, kind of give you the stamp of approval to reduce their steroid dose by, you know, usually about 20 to 25 percent at a time. That makes sense. Any pitfalls I should look out for 
in this process? Where do, where do people go wrong? Where do they, where do they move too fast? What, where do they get false hope that ends up coming back and biting them in the rear? Um, what, what do I need to look out for, Andrew? I think the biggest thing that, that, that we worry about with IMHA is that it can be really easy to focus in on the red blood cells because, of course, that is what is so dangerously low and we need to replace. But what we know about this disease is that one of the leading causes of death is that these are patients who are at a very high risk for forming blood clots and having embolic disease. So whether that be most commonly a pulmonary thromboembolism or something maybe um, like an ATE like in cats or to the brain or something like that. So um, blood clots are a real risk. And so making sure as a as a clinician that in addition to addressing the immune mediated aspect of this, that you're also having them on some kind of good prophylaxis to reduce their risk of clot formation is really important for these guys because, you know, it's, it's shocking that they don't really die of their anemia as long as you're, uh, you've got a client that can afford blood product and things Mm -hmm. like that, because we can always give them more red blood cells, but it's the um, onset of a, a pulmonary thromboembolism that can make these guys really decline. Okay, talk to me a little bit about the about the uh, you know anti clot medications. Uh, what what are your what are your top choices for that? And 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 are you know are these are these medications cost prohibitive? Yeah, well, so thankfully the answer to your second question is no longer the case. There are some really cost effective options, but um, in terms of what are the options out there, there's kind of two ways to look at this. You can either inhibit the clotting factors with something in the heparin family. Mm-hmm. Or, Um, those are accessible, but can be a bit cost prohibitive and certainly can be challenging from the standpoint of administration and monitoring, right? So there are people that would advocate strongly to use a heparin, and I don't think that's wrong, but it's got, case selection is really important that you've got a client that is able to give that medication because um, if you're going to be sending it home, it's a subcutaneous injection, and you've got to have the ability to be regularly monitored, monitoring things like their clotting time. So um, I don't use those all that frequently, but I think that there is a place for it. And, and certainly the um, kind of IMHA experts out there are somewhat split on what would be the best approach. But the other approach um, that is certainly uh, more convenient and accessible would be an antiplatelet drug. So something that's going to inhibit the platelets. And for a long time, um, low dose aspirin was used and that is still appropriate, but is somewhat falling out of favor just because we have some good research that suggests that about half of the dogs we use that in might have some degree of aspirin resistance. So we might mm-hmm. not be you know, achieving what we were hoping. And so the antiplatelet drug clopidogrel, which is a kind of brand name Plavix, um, used to be somewhat cost prohibitive, but now is available as a generic and is a mainstay for um, platelet inhibition. It's a irreversible platelet inhibitor. It does a really nice job of, of, of reducing that platelet function so that you don't um, you know, form clots and things like that. So that tends to be a lot of people's go-to for, um, for antiplatelet. And then there's a newer drug, an anti-10A inhibitor called rivaroxaban that is getting a lot of attention and people are really excited about. And, and I think it's going to be wonderful. And there are already groups using it for things like saddle thrombus in cats, but that is quite cost prohibitive at this point. So I think there's a lot of people just watching the, the market to see when that goes generic, because I have a feeling it's going to come in real handy for diseases like this in the future. That's fantastic. That's great. I, I always love to hear, it's like, oh, there's something new and yeah. it's <laughs> looking real good and, and, it, and it's, it's in the pipeline. That makes me super happy. Uh, Andrew, thank you for being here. Do you have any uh, resources that you really like in this subject matter? Uh, any place that you would say, hey, this is a, uh, this is a good place uh, just to pick up some more tips and pearls. Anything that pops to your mind? Yeah, I, I'm, to me, something really exciting that happened, I, I want to say it was in 2016 or 2017, is that the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine published a consensus statement. And, and they usually publish two to three consensus statements a year. But that year, they published a consensus statement about IMHA. It's two full articles, one dedicated to a consensus on the diagnostics to be performed for IMHA, and another article dedicated to treatment for IMHA. And they're a fantastic resource and a great read. And I think what is interesting about them is that they actually reveal in so many ways, the parts of IMHA for which we don't have a consensus yet, because it's still a work in progress and we're still learning so much about this disease. So, um, uh, but I think for, for people that uh, maybe don't see IMHA that often and, and, and are wondering what, what's out there and what do I need to know, that's a really great resource. 
outstanding. I'll pull that. Uh, I'll put a link in the show notes uh, so that people can check it out for sure. Andrew, thanks for being here, man. I really appreciate it. Sure thing. And that's it. That's what I got for you guys. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you liked the episode. If you did, if you're watching on YouTube, hit that subscribe button. If you're not, uh, wherever you get your podcast, if you love to leave us a little review, that means the world to me. If, um, yeah, if you like learning, uh, check out the DrAndyRourke.com website and take a look at our store. We've got some training tools. I have a Charming the Angry Client course and an exam room communication toolkit course. Both of them are on demand. Both of them are very, very good. They are both very flexible and they are a great way to learn with your team. Guys, until next time, take care of yourselves. I'll talk to you later on.